For its fourth installment, the Insidious franchise takes another step back in time. We see one of Elise Rainier's earliest childhood experiences with the other side. And then we see her as a full-grown ghost hunter who's made to revisit her past in cruel and surprising ways. While the story is mostly a standalone adventure for the spiritual psychic, The Last Key still draws on the mythology of the series, and features some of the central players of the franchise in fun and fresh new ways. Let's take a look at how Insidious The Last Key explores Elise's devastating backstory and wraps things up on a note of continuity. Pattern of Possession In childhood, Elise is tormented by more than just the spirits that occupy her family home. Her prison guard father is also heavy-handed with punishment to the point of abuse. Clearly deranged, he insists he can beat the ghostly visions out of her and fears her supernatural gifts. Summoned back to the property in her later years by the home's new occupant, Ted Garza, she discovers he's kidnapped and tortured a woman in the basement for months. He claims something has invaded his mind. He's in my head. But he's still ultimately done away with by Specs. Afterwards, Elise continues to explore and uncover more terrible secrets about the history of the home, including her own father's similar abduction and the slaughter of a woman in that very spot. Elise realizes both men were possessed by the demon that terrorized her in her youth, and instead of getting revenge on her ghost dad in the further, she decides not to feed the demon herself. It's not clear that all of her father's bad behaviors were due to the demonic force, but he does apologize to her in ghost form before withering back into his spiritual cell. Weapon of Love the true big bad of the movie is the Key Monster. Elise first runs into it in childhood after her father banishes her to the basement, with a voice summoning her to a keyhole that unlocks the door to the demon's lair. Her mother is the first true victim of that mistake, as she attempts to rescue Elise from the basement but is instead strangled by the nefarious spirit while Elise remains in a state of demonic hypnosis. Her mother's passing is a tragedy for Elise and her brother, a woman-loving parent, she'd given him a whistle to blow if he ever felt scared of Elise's sightings. As we see in Elise's older years, the whistle was lost for decades, but it pops up during her return to the old home, and it's used by tortured spirits to guide her throughout her battle, since the key demon deprives his victims of the ability to speak. When Elise confronts the demon in its lair, it outmaneuvers her and deprives her of her voice too. But she finds a whistle in time to summon the spirit of her mother, who's able to vanquish the beast through the sheer power of her love and light. It's not clear if Elise's mother will ever escape the otherworldly prison below that house, but she does seem at peace when Elise departs. Coaching herself One of the most surprising encounters Elise experiences during her time in the further is when she runs into herself as a child in the basement. She doesn't tell the child version of herself who she is, but does insist that young Elise use her gifts to help people, despite her father's tyrannical treatment. If only she'd been able to tip off the child that the girl she spots in the laundry room at the age of 16 is very real, she might have been able to save Anna. Alas, she does at least encourage her to use her nightmares for the betterment of the world and to never back down from demons, otherworldly or otherwise. The Family Business Although Elisa's brother is none too thrilled to see her again, decades after she'd escaped their father's menacing clutches, he doesn't have a choice but to welcome her when she rescues his daughters. After Elise informs Christian that she found his old whistle in the home, he decides the relic is important enough to track down. Problem is, his youngest daughter Melissa is summoned down to the basement by the Key Demon, who makes short order of adding Elisa's niece to its collection of victims. Elise senses the attack and returns to the property, promising to find her. After she's temporarily incapacitated below, though, the other sister Imogen decides to try her own hand at psychic work and is lulled into a state of hypnosis by Tucker and Specs. I can see things too. She's there on a rescue mission, but it's Elise who ultimately leads the two girls back to safety, and Christian is grateful for her salvation of his daughters. Meanwhile, Imogen is now tapped into her own paranormal gifts, and Elise's legacy can maybe live on through another generation. And that's very, very important to the franchise as a whole because the movie finishes with a direct link to the timeline of the original in City movies. Elise dreams about a boy named Dalton being haunted by the red-faced demon we come to know so well in the earlier installments, and sees Renee and Josh lying in bed and lamenting the unknown that's troubling their child. Elise awakens to receive a call from Lorraine, who reminds her that she helped her son Josh, as we saw in the flashback events of Insidious 2, and now the same thing is happening to Dalton. That's the catalyst for the events of the first Insidious, of course, when Elise helps Dalton escape from the further, only to be strangled by Josh who's been possessed by the same demon that haunted him as a child. Insidious 2 left off with Elise still working her demon battling magic, following Tucker and Specs to new spectral assignments. But with the added element of Imogen, a new medium who can work with Elise from the earthly plane, the ghost-busting business might not be done for for the Insidious team just yet.
Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.